Hello, good evening. Thank you all for coming. We are bringing out some more chairs, so uh, there will be more space. This is such a wonderful turnout. Thank you for joining us. My name is Vanessa, and I'm an intern here at the Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, before you get started, I'd like to thank everyone for turning their so phones on silent. And if anyone needs hearing assistance devices, we have a couple out in the atrium. Um, I'm happy to grab it for you if you'd like or anything, just let me know. Uh, tonight, we're fortunate to have poet Keith Taylor here with us for the launch of his new collection of selected poems, All the Time You Want, Selected Poems, 1977 to 2017. In this collection, Taylor, acclaimed poet of the Upper Midwest and the author of 18 celebrated collections, delivers a stunning medley of his most lasting work, poems that remain vivid in the imagination that have achieved a life far beyond their first appearance on the page. Keith Taylor has authored or edited 18 books and chapbooks, the most recent of which, published in 2021, is Let Them Be Left, Isle Royal Poems. His last full-length collection, The Bird While, was published by Wayne State University Press and won the bronze medal for the Forward Indies Poetry Book of the Year. He's received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs, among others. This event tonight is in partnership with Literati Bookstore. They have a table set up in the hallway, which you all passed on your way in, and there'll be an opportunity for signing afterwards. So please help me welcome Keith Taylor. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you to the library. Um, thank you to the Zank Books and their publisher, Steve Gillis. Um, and I have to stop a minute to get so I don't go on forever, but also I just realized I got to take a picture of you guys. <laughs> Facebook's going to go nuts with this. All right. Um, <laughs> So when Steve first approached me about this book, he, he, he used the phrase he wanted to do collected poems. And I said, no, I'm, I'm too young for collected poems. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a selected. And um, yeah, I'll, do, I'll do a collected when, when I'm in my 80s. But that's only eight and a half years from now. So um, you know, I'm already thinking about it. Um, doing a selected, and I had certain things in mind. These are, these are poems that are coming out of lots of books, some of them obscure, tiny little books. Um, but I wanted to put the, well, if, if some of you know the great poet Mary Rufo. If not, I recommend you look her up. She's, she's great. Um, she's done a selected poems, and there were no distinctions in her book between books. She just put the poems there and let them rip. Um, basically chronologically, but just let them rip. So I wanted to do that. Now, I, I went one better, and I asked the Zank Books not to put any page numbers on there, so you'd just sort of be swimming in there. Now that I'm actually holding the book, and now that people are beginning to try to you know, say things about it in public, it might have been a mistake. You know? It's like, <laughs> oh, where was that poem? Well, you know, it was somewhere in here after that. So I, you know, I'm not quite sure what I was thinking, Steve, but you know, I was thinking something. Um, and uh, uh, so there are no page numbers. Um, so it, it's chronological, and then this, the things that you discover. So I've had, you know, poets who do this. You know, we, we, have, we all have poems that we know are always going to appeal to an audience. Um, and, you know, and that's great. It's nice. I'm going to give a reading in a, in a senior's home. I'm going to give a reading in an elementary school. I can read this poem, and they're going to love it. The trouble is, you do that over a number of years, and you get sick of those poems. So um, I have some poems that even one or two of you might know that are not in here. Um, and I hope you're not totally disappointed when you realize that your favorite poem isn't in here. Uh, but that's okay. But I discovered things about myself, which I, was, was, I didn't expect in this process. I thought this process would be easier and quicker than it was. Uh, you, you look back over 40 years, and, and it's like, oh, well, there's all kinds of things there. And where, what are they? And, and who is this person? If, if for, you know, well, you're here because you at least know me or have heard something about me. And uh, that's probably that I am a Michigan nature poet, or 
nature poet from the Great Lakes. And that's absolutely fine with me. I, I don't mind that at all. I'm even proud of it. Um, but one of the things that, that I discovered about myself in here is there were all these things I wrote about that over the years that I uh, that also defined me that were different than that. So it's a, this makes this gives this book a different feel, uh, not really intentionally. It just as all these things add up, it uh, they become something different. For instance, um, early on uh, in when I first started publishing in the late seventies and early eighties, um, I wrote a lot about my uh, religious upbringing, uh, which was a uh, water. I grew up in a, in a very conservative Mennonite sect in rural areas of Western Canada, and I wrote a lot about those people. And actually, the, my breakthrough poems, the poems when I said, oh, now I'm writing poems, which happened when I was 25 in 1977. Um, you know, these, are, these are poems dealing with that religious upbringing, and that sort of startled me because I wanted to be a French intellectual at that point in my life. Um, and here I was writing about the farm, you know. Um, it was a different thing. I'm going to read you the first poem in the book, which is about my sainted grandmother, um, kind of a, a Protestant nun. And I, I ran into an old, and she was in Alberta, but I ran into an old man once at a camp meeting in Nebraska, and he told me about my grandmother when my grandmother was young before she, you know, got saved. Um, and part of this is the story of my grandmother. Oh, I also should say that for my group, just about anything that was fun was a sin, uh, and that, of, that of course, included dancing. Um, so dancing was a, a terribly sinful thing. The Holy Dance. We hear they've opened an old folks' home in her name. We're proud. We remember her black dresses shining like Bibles, her hand moving lightly over our backs and arms, her prayers long and touching. I timed her once, 16 minutes of grace before supper. Only an old man who moved south to Nebraska remembers how she moved and the hard burning behind her at the barn dance where she turned fast, spinning, her white dress swirling out quicker until everything pulled in, even light. So that I did, there was a whole series of these family poems, which are the ones that, that I feel, to, and maybe more strongly now, were, the, were the, the breakthrough poems, the poems that taught me I could do this. Uh, the other thing I started writing about early on, and this didn't hit me till much later, is that I've written an awful lot about work. Um, I had my whole life was, you know, up until I ended up with cushy jobs in my old age um, <laughs> at the University of Michigan. Uh, the uh, um, I did I did I worked hard, physically demanding jobs. My father put me out painting houses when I was 12, and I painted houses for a long time. I did all my education. Of course, education was cheaper in those days, and all my traveling, and of course, you could hitchhike. There's a long poem about hitchhiking in here, which I'm not going to read tonight. Uh, but uh, so here's a poem I wrote back in the day about, yeah, sort of about, painting houses. The house painter's recreation. The house painter goes to bars where interested women ask him what he does. He says, I paint. They treat him with respect, even awe. They see brown paint under his nails and imagine he paints dark canvases full of angst and sorrow. He smiles sadly when they talk to him. One offers to pose, but he says, I don't do people. <laughs> she understands. There's also a lot of love poems in here, none of which I'm going to be able to read since my wife is in the audience and since I've become a very teary old man. Um, so I'll, I'll try to uh, get to the point where I, uh, I I will not break down in front of you. Oh, here's a little one that, that you know, had died. It was in an obscure little journal and, you know, over one of the community colleges around Detroit, and then it was in an obscure little chat book and disappeared. But uh, uh, I was reading it, and, and I said, oh, I kind of like this living here, in the middle of the thing, or walking through the arcade, I wait. I wait because the only lesson I've learned is that the gift comes in its own time and goes without scent or taste or flashing signs.
as, as many of you know, since you contributed to my livelihood and the livelihood of other people sitting here, I worked for a long time as a bookseller, um, which was a great job, although it was a job I did not always want to go to, but nonetheless, I did. Um, and, uh, and, oh, and I, got, I felt very responsible job. I was, you know, I was a responsible employee. I was always there. Right, Gene? I'm looking at Gene. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was like, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't even necessarily value that side of my character, but nonetheless, I was there. And then it made me miss some good opportunities, my responsibility. So this essentially has a long title, but the, the rest of the title all becomes um, kind of a dedication. An apology to the late Stephen Dunning for not taking the poet William Stafford on a bird walk in Nichols Ar Arboretum circa 1987-88 because I had to go to work in a bookshop. <laughs> the time clock has moved inside where it holds its ticking sway more completely than it does hanging on the wall at work. It might be called responsibility if it weren't so silly. I have to live with what's been done. They, the tax collectors, money grubbers, guardians of the ordinary, have given me a merchant's soul. When you called to ask if I would walk through the arboretum with the old poet, famous in our small poetry world, the one we might call teacher if master feels too heavy on our common American ear, I didn't hesitate. I said, no, of course, the only answer I've learned. I have to work. I never thought. The leaves had finished changing, I imagine, and most of them were down. It was nice of you to call. The walk would have been remembered by no one but me, yet I like to think that maybe I have a regional knowledge of trees, geology, bird migrations, information he might use to make another beautiful poem, one that might give some poor soul circumscribed by a stupid job or another hidden time clock pause and a momentary sense of the utter loveliness of things. But that is too much ambition. I am a clerk. I never met the poet. I never will. I went to work, punched in, did my duty on the register, and helped a few people buy things they don't really need. Outside, you walk through the leaves. This was a poem, by the way, there, there were three poems. This and, oh, well, thank you, Harold. Um, the, uh, um, there are 3.2 in, in the next book, which will be out in the fall from Wayne State. Um, and this one that I discovered in a cache of poems from the 80s that a friend, a friend of Leggett's and mine discovered this poems that we'd all been sending to each other long before email. Um, and most of them were pretty forgettable and several were just you know, pretty bad. Um, but there were three of them and I said, oh, I can revise these. So this poem, it did have a little life. Um, Actually, it's not yet out, but it will have a little light, life in a magazine, and, and then, um, then it's here. And that poem just hid for 35 years. didn't go anywhere. Um, booksellers go on lunch break, and uh, things in, an, in Ann Arbor, things happen to them. Um, and uh, this was one. I felt the need to write a curse poem. Uh, and I, some of you who know poems by my friend Thomas Lynch will recognize the rhythms of this because I stole them from him. For the kids who yelled, hey, Baldy. Remember, children, your own aging and bring back to youth sodden minds this moment when your knees start their small explosions and your backs carry the ache of your dull futures. Remember, O oh frail youth, Elisha, tonsured and holy, who called down two she-bears from the hills to maul the boys who mocked his baldness. Remember, Elisha, and look to the hills, because this prophet on lunch break calls down bears, hemorrhoids, bunions, varicose veins, corns, impotence, and masses of gray hair to thin the smugness of all your curls. <laughs> And uh, when you got, you'll notice that, by the way, I, I was a bookseller in Ann Arbor for about 20 years. And then I taught at the University of Michigan for about 20 years. And, and there are three or four or more former colleagues in here. And I don't want you to think I'm, I'm dissing this. But I got a lot of poems about selling books. I think I've got two about teaching. I don't know what that means. But um, it's all, it also affects my dream. I dream about selling books all the time. 
I very seldom dream about teaching, and when I do, of course, they're awful dreams. You gotta stand up in front of 100 people and you don't have a shirt on, you know, and, and I don't want people to see me without a shirt. It's, it's the way of the world. So um, here's another one about selling books. I mean, you do, you know, it is, can be a dull job and you try to make it interesting, so you run these little scenarios through your mind. There are probably 50 people in here to whom I sold books, so this is what I was really thinking of. <laughs> Cashier's dream, the hunt. At that moment, call it the float if you like, but the precise moment between your giving me the money and my giving you the merchandise, the thing you want or need for a small profit, a fair profit, no one's getting rich here, just enough to buy food or pay for my children's clothes or the gas bill. At that moment, we have entered the hunt, the clear air of early morning. I have not moved in an hour or more, not even swallowed in fear of frightening off the prey. At that moment, I launch my spear or stone with prayers that it bring down the brother, my brother, my prey, you. <laughs> and before the bloodletting, the skinning, I thank the gods of the hunt, the spirit of the beast, and I thank you when you tuck whatever thing I've sold you under your arm and begin to leave, returning to your careless, ordinary day. I'm trying not to dwell tonight in my own mind on those who have gone before us, but that last line, Larry Goldstein and I, the late Larry Goldstein, died just uh, well, maybe a year ago now. We had three exchanges. He was a meticulous editor at the Michigan Quarterly Review, and he and I, I had three exchanges of letters about that word careless in the last line, your careless, ordinary day. He wanted it. I didn't. Uh, well, he won. He was, he, was, he was a good editor. Um, Another one of those stories, at least this bookseller told himself, this is in prose. I'm going to read it, I'm not, I don't see him here, but Michael, who owns Literati, this is the favorite thing of mine that he likes, and it's called Bookseller. I don't really care about the characters in books, certainly not about the people who write them. I'm not much interested in their contents, how one book supports or argues with another. I like the objects, the shape and color of them, and the pleasure they take in themselves. They create abstract patterns, a large red book separated from a small blue one by a used yellow, or a whole shelf assuming 20 shades of green, the variations blending into each other until individual volumes almost disappear. The books make an ever-evolving kaleidoscope, colors shifting into new patterns almost every day. I prefer to think that it's willed, chosen by the books themselves. But there is a deeper joy in the bookshop, one that comes despite or because of my need to keep the books in some kind of order. A book on tantric meditation will suddenly appear in the psychology section. I reshelve it. A month later, it pops up in the European history section. Six months after, it's in the last shelves of the poetry books, looking comfortable between Yeats and Zukovsky. <laughs> the books find their own order. Their movement seems to dance with a geologic tempo, so slow I can't see it. The dance is like the, country, is like the story country children tell about trees moving at night, just a millimeter or two, nothing that can be noticed in the morning until one day a child climbs onto a rope swing that's tied to a maple branch and he swings out as he has done hundreds of times before, but this time slams straight to the side of the barn. I have a wonderful friend up in Mount Pleasant named Eric Torgerson, some of you know. Eric went through a phase in the 80s and early 90s where he was publishing essays all over and the poetry journals about new formalism, about how we all had to know the traditional forms. And he and I would argue about this endlessly. And I took the point that, Eric, we all know the traditional forms. We just don't feel the need that they have to be recycled again. But we know them, you know, you know a good deal of us know them. And uh, um, we never, came to a resolution of that, and we're still very good friends. But uh, I did write Eric a sonnet, uh, although I didn't show it to him for a long time. Macy, he may not have seen it till he saw this book, actually. Um, but I wrote, well, his daughter's 40 now, and I think she was five when I wrote this, so you can tell, it's an old poem. 
Um, so you hopefully you won't hear it, but it's a sonnet. It has the it has the meter, and it has even has at least in the sestet, and it has a sestet. Uh, it even has the rhyme. So, uh, old songs at Green Lake for Eric and Ann. Between the long peninsula built its length and breadth with cinder block summer homes and the national music camp across the way, loon song, softly at first, almost unnoticed while we make our dinner on a grill and walk the dog, a song like children laughing on a boat that's drifting off rises from the lake. The loons too have settled for less than the ideal. True northern lakes keep moving north. The loons nest in reedy, cor reedy corners, protected from the wake of speedboats, do the necessary things to raise their young, and then they sing. Here's a little one that I sort of forgot. It was toward the back of a book from, oh, 2006, I think. And... Uh, while I was working on this, my friend Chris, who's here, she uh, wrote me a little note and said, oh, I like this poem a lot, and I sent it to a friend who uh, just had a, an anniversary. Um, so, metaphor for the long married. Beyond familiarity, there is a small lighted space, comfortable, bright enough without blinding, warm enough for relief on a cold day, a small place surrounded by an interesting darkness where you travel at leisure the place that glows at the edge of perception that always waits to take you back inside. Here's the work I sometimes convinced myself I wanted to do. A monk's rule. For Christine, of course. But for you, my love, I would take a monk's rule. Rise long before dawn, have a simple breakfast of unbuttered toast and milk one cup of coffee, black. I would go upstairs, sit with paper and pen, and plumb the deepest reaches of my mind or soul or self. Evenings, I would read nothing but books written in the first millennium. Um, okay, here's a poem. It's a title poem of the book, All the Time You Want. I, this poem was a commission from Evan Chambers to accompany... Um, a long symphonic song cycle he wrote called The Old Burying Ground. It's burying, not burial, right? Yeah, burying. Um, and uh, he, he wrote beautiful songs um, from the uh, epitaphs on the cemetery in somewhere in Upper New England. I was, at the time, working on a uh, thing where I discovered some really horrible stories, uh, sad stories, about my immigrant uh, relatives in Western Canada. Um, stories that the family had hidden because they were so sad. And I went there and I went to the cemetery that's described in this poem. Um, Evan's piece begins with this beautiful introduction and then both at the concerts and, and on rec record, then I read this poem, which is the title poem of this book. This piece was performed with the University Symphony Orchestra at Carnegie Hall. So I had my moment doing this at Carnegie Hall. That's pretty cool. Um, and uh, uh, as I walked in there in that wonderful, ostentatious place and you're looking out at this, you know, 2,500 basically Michigan fans <laughs> who'd come to see the <laughs> symphony orchestra, or you know, other, other people too, but, but and, I'm, and I'm thinking about my desperately poor Irish immigrant relatives having horrible lives in Alberta and buried in this obscure little cemetery in the middle of nowhere, and I said, whoa, I've got to stop this or I'm going to start crying in front of all these 2,500 people at Carnegie Hall, you know, so I, I started thinking about something else and still had to get up and read the poem and I think it went okay, but. So, all the time you want. Take the chain from the gate, walk in. No one really cares. Most of the stones have faded, are cracked or broken. Designed as a churchyard like the ones left behind in the old country, the yard outlasted its church. All the kids who could moved to town years ago. Someone mows, but not often. Here you are free to invent whatever tales you need, please. Take all the time you want. See that obelisk bury, barely a yard tall, tilting over in the back corner, about to fall? It marks another common story, early death, illness, and a miserable marriage. If you think you have some time, you can pick weeds from the plot or try to write that stone. There's little else to do here. 
that's an, I mean, it's, it's more isolated now in Alberta than it probably was in the early 20th century. Um, and it's, it's the middle of nowhere. But I had a student on her way to Alaska who was emailing me. He said, I'm in Alberta. Tell me where to go. I said, do you want to go to my family cemetery? <laughs> Much to my surprise, she said yes. Uh, so she went and she, uh, you know, she, put, uh, she put flowers on great-grandmother's grave and uh, sent me a picture, which, of course, I put on Facebook. Um, many of you know Ann Carson. Ann Carson at least spent some of the year among us here. Um, and uh, when she first got to town, um, she told me she wanted to see an owl. So I took her to see one at the Wendy's east of Celine. And that's the title of the poem. I have, she has, you know, she has, I, mean, I don't want to say a cult follow, but she followed, but she has devoted readers. And um, many of them are former students of mine. And uh, one of them came up and said, you took Ann Carson to Wendy's? <laughs> yeah, she really liked the chili. No, we just went to the parking lot. At the Wendy's east of Celine for Ann Carson. Behind the back parking lot, close to the factory that makes molded plastic parts, bumpers, knobs, and cup holders for the big Ford pickup trucks, in a scrubby stand of oaks next to a subdivision of vinyl-sided houses, a great horned owl peers over the edge of her nest, seemingly unperturbed, as if she's been watching there for two or three thousand years. Um, the cover of this poem, um, if those of you who follow Uma as closely as I do, this, this painting was there. It was in a show they did uh, last, the summer of 2022. Uh, then they, they bought it for its permanent collection. Um, it was commissioned for uh, the, a show they did called Watershed. And they commissioned a painter they knew, although I didn't. His name was Khaled Al Sa'i. He's a Syrian uh, painter, and he lives in Dubai. Um, and they, they commissioned this for it, and apparently they did because they know he lives in a desert country but is obsessed with the Great Lakes. We love him already, right? Um, and uh, uh, he hunted up, you know, poems about the Great Lakes online, and he found mine, which is, um, which is in a site that gets around a fair amount. And my poem was an ekphrastic reaction to um, a painting in the, in, in the Uma. It's the painting by Whistler called Sea and Rain. It's, it's up there in the walk around in the old part. There's the, the Monet that we all know here, and then there's Nick Del Banco's uh, Rodin maquettes, and then there's this Whistler. And it, it's basically a color abstract. It looks like line, different colored lines of things going this way. And he's got a real hazy figure down in the bottom left-hand corner. And suddenly well, that figure changes everything. Um, I had just done a couple, uh, or it, it seen and been part, a participant in one anyway, of a couple of dance things uh, on the shores of Lake Michigan. One was a big multimedia piece with Jessica Fogel, and the other one, my friend Elizabeth Schmuel just did um, a simple video dance of her dancing on the beach. So you've got those lines of sand, water, sky, and then you have the dancers moving ahead of them. So, um, so he said, saw this poem, and then he painted this picture, if you have the picture in front of you, you can see that that swirl is, uh, actually looks like a dancing figure, which I think is very cool. What he did was translate my poem into Arabic and then created the swirling figure out of the letters and words uh, from his translation of my poem. So, and then I put it on the book of poems. It had the poem in it, so it, I thought it was very cool. Um, maybe one or two of you will too. Sea and Rain, Lake Michigan after James McNeil Whistler. There's a dance at water's edge, a movement between the lake, its sand, and the horizon where lake becomes cloud. Between those lines are worlds a thin wash of muted tones, beige and gray with a hint of white, almost abstract, until the dancer steps out into the pool. She makes the whole thing real. That was a long introduction to a nine-line poem. Um, 
I've got to read this one because this is one of the poems I've written about teaching. <laughs> um, although it's uh, teaching up at the biological station, which I did for a dozen years. The University of Michigan's biological station is just south of the bridge, about 20 miles. Wonderful place. Summer teaching. Driving the young scientists back from a beaver dam, I listened to their talk about life as information encoded in letters between spiraling strands of protein. How we will soon digitize our sequences and the information that is us, everything about us, will never die. I drive carefully on the back roads and the freeway, hoping that whatever gods left today haven't heard or are off chasing beautiful children who escape by turning into trees. I'll end with this poem, and then if maybe I'll take a couple questions. I think we have time for that. Yeah. Um, here's my uh, Ann Arbor after the human beings have gone. <laughs> um, and of course, my childhood memorizing the King James Version of the Bible comes into the title anyway. I will lift up mine eyes. When the world is finally theirs again, they will come down from the hills out west of town. They'll follow straight lines they learned so quickly, even using the bridges that haven't yet crumbled into walls or into nothing at all. When they stop to hunt rats or raccoons at a house broken open when oaks blew over, they'll step gingerly. They are always so careful where they place their paws on what's left of our moldy books, avoiding the still shimmering plastic shards of the Anthropocene. So thank you. And don't have, don't have to make it too awkward, but um, you know, I can certainly take a couple of questions if anybody has one. And then the awkward pause begins. Allison. <laughs> For you, Allison, I will. Yes, which one? Which one? Oh, any poem. Allison didn't get enough poems. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, got to sign books and I don't want to. Uh, read the one about faith. The one that was on the radio yesterday? OK, OK. <laughs> this is another prose one. You'll notice that I avoided my family. Um, so, uh, Faith, if I can't make it, you'll have to come up and finish this. Can't do it. <laughs> can't do it. Sorry. Uh, it's a nice poem. It's called Black Ice. Um, it was uh, it's a prose piece. It's in a book that John Knott and I did um, on the Huron River. John Knott, who just passed away at the beginning of the year. Um, but we did a good book. Dave, David has one. Oh, Allison will read it for me. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> it's my disguise. <laughs> just pretend like I'm Keith. Black ice. Some things shouldn't frighten me. I should know better. If given half a chance at a party or over drinks, I will bore my friends with stories about ice skating across prairie sloughs 40 years ago, learning how to turn quickly and handle a puck. Yet when my seven-year-old daughter and I drive down by the Huron River after a two-week cold snap and find the large pond behind Barton Dam completely frozen and carrying several families of skaters, I feel the flutter of my new and overeducated fear. Of course I let her go out on the ice. I go with her. We stare down through several inches of black ice at the plants drifting in the slight current. We hope to see a cold fish swim by. She kicks a stone across the ice, squealing with pleasure at its speed and distance. She wants to kick it all the way across, over to the marina below the rich people's homes. That's when I get scared. I call her back, 
and climb out on the dike above the water. She keeps kicking her stone across the ice, and I notice pressure cracks. I begin to imagine the groans and cracks of ice. Come on, Faith, we have to go, I call out. And she ignores me as she has done for most of her life. <laughs> I keep calling, and still she ignores me kicking her rock across the frozen river, sliding on her feet, her knees, even her butt, laughing and laughing. I call again, more urgently, and then again. I try to sound tough and threaten loss of privileges. She kicks the rock out farther and keeps going. Keith. Yeah, so I can't do those things anymore. Aging, man, it's got, who, who knew that was one of the drawbacks? But it is. Anybody else want to ask me anything? Yeah, I mean, I came in, University of Michigan was very, very good to me. Um, and they're still good to me. They still do things nice for me. Um, and there was absolutely no reason they should be. Um, and and uh, I'd, picked, I'd helped them out early in the 90s when somebody, you know, a graduate student decided she just couldn't teach and I went in and taught. Um, and I had done a little bit of teaching up at Central before I moved to Ann Arbor. But I went in there and, of course, you know, I didn't screw up. And they're used to having graduate students teach those intro to creative writing classes, and graduate students occasionally screw up. So I didn't screw up. Um, I got good evaluations. The students actually, I think, learned something, so they kept asking me back. By 2000, they'd asked me. I'd published a little bit more and you know, had that legitimacy, even if I didn't have the kinds of degrees that they like, as they should. Um, so uh, one of the chairs of the English department asked me to take over as uh, running this undergraduate concentration in creative writing, and so I did. Um, I'd, the temptation of teaching after being working in a bookstore was uh, pretty irresistible. Now, I've, I've got to say some things that, that uh, some of the professor types sitting here might not <laughs> like me to say, but after working in a bookstore for 20 years, 50 weeks a year, 40 to 60 hours a week, five to seven days a week, teaching with five months off a year, and uh, um, you know, all the other things, great health insurance, um, you know, with, for my whole friggin' family, um, it, it was irresistible. I did not, I, I loved book selling, I really did, and I loved book selling in Ann Arbor, but this was pretty irresistible, and it gave me a lot of time. And I wasn't 25 when that happened, I was 47 when I switched professions. So I, knew I could value that time, I, and I could use it pretty productively. And I think I did some, some okay things for a few years. I sort of lost energy toward the end. But you know, I kept some things going. I did, you know, put together a couple of conferences and um, you know, did some public things for the university, the kind of things that are supposed to happen. So uh, I think I earned my money. The other thing to say is, and there's probably lecturers in here, even as a lecturer, at the University of Michigan, I made substantially more money than I was making managing a small independent bookshop. So the money made a difference. Uh, so I got more time. I had things I wanted to write. I had things I knew I had to write. I wanted the time to do that. I wanted to stop worrying about money. And uh, so yeah, it had an effect. Um, and it had a very positive effect. Now, would it have had that effect if I was 20, or as I was 30? Maybe not, but closer to 50. Um, it was really, I was able to use it. Um, and God, the resources the university has. I mean, you know, the thing with Evan, uh, you know, the, if I hadn't been at the university, would I have read a poem in the stage of Carnegie Hall, you know? Yes. Or, yes, thank you, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and those resources. I got two professor types here, but Steve, yeah. Um, it was before computers, so all those poems were typed once and, and 
the, the notes and everything thrown away. So there was only one copy of them. I had a relationship with the French woman for a few years, a very tempestuous French woman, which when I was 20 was the reason she was so attractive. When I was 23, it was a lot less attractive. <laughs> um, and uh, she, was, she knew things and she was smart and uh, she knew French literature and she read my poems and threw them out a window. Um, six stories high. And uh, um, so the poems disappeared. Steve, I would probably be embarrassed. Although, you know what? The lovely thing about surviving, and so many poets don't survive, um, is that you look back on these things that you think were going to be so embarrassing. And it's kind of like, man, wasn't I smart at 19? <laughs> uh, there's that temptation. I'm, 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 you know, since I'm beginning to think about this collected poems, I've already got a section called Juvenalia. Um, and it's like, yeah, no, Steve won't even want to publish that, I don't think so. Uh, Peter, yeah. I certainly tried to forget about it for decades. I'm not forgetting about it now. Um, and the other thing you'll see if you read this book, there are things, there are little moments that come in early on, which you can assume was sometimes 1980 or before. And there are things that come in at the end, which you, you know, which you can assume were just a few years ago. Um, and to see that, that's interesting. Um, the retrospective, it's, I mean, it certainly exists now, and I find it, I, I find it useful, Peter. Um, I can totally understand. I mean, you don't want to sit around and be in some sort of self-congratulatory thing. You're not going to get any new work done if you do that. Um, but um, I do find it useful. And I find that, that, like when I was doing this, I'm hunting up these old things and old files and little journals that disappeared 30 years ago and things, and, and finding these poems, it was like, oh, that that asks some questions that I'm still thinking about and that haven't been answered. Um, and, and presents itself in odd ways. I did a thing on Michigan Radio yesterday and April Bear from Stateside, who's you know, real smart, and she was, you know, she was pointing out to me that I never really got over my religious upbringing. And I like to think that I've recovered from that. <laughs> you know, um, I don't have a lot to do with it anymore. Um, but April was pointing out how it's, still there, even when you think you're writing about art or the natural world, that that stuff is still. Um, and you know, am I gonna have to think about that some more? Maybe, maybe. How many poems did I write? Well, you know, last year I put these two books together. <laughs> that changes your work schedule, you know, because you're, you're thinking about other things. But I did write new poems. I, I just looked, I, just like three weeks ago, I counted the pages I have since the Wayne State book, which was, is post 2017. So the Wayne State book was gonna go up to, well, it's, it's my COVID book, so it goes up through COVID. And I have 18 new poems and three prose poems. So there's still work there, it's still coming. Um, and you know, and my mother died 42 years ago. And two weeks ago, I wrote a poem about my mother's death. So, which I had not written about, you believe me, you will never hear me read it in public. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, um, you know, so that stuff is, I mean, I'm, you know, I feel so glad that you made it this far. I mean, God, how many people do you know that didn't make it this far? Um, yeah, so, so yeah, but the, the, I'm still doing it. Advice. I wish my advice was more original than it is. Um, but if you're, if you're starting to write poems, you're starting to do it because um, something in you is compelling you, maybe even obsessing you, but you have to do it. Um, cherish that. That's what the reaction to it, the, the whatever small accolades that come in the poetry world, and, and you have to remind yourself that they're always small. There are no famous poets. Um, even the dead ones, except for Shakespeare and Dante, even the dead ones aren't famous. Um, 
And um, so you can't really, there's nothing that's going to validate your poems outside you. You've just got to meet the poems where they are. Um, and then, you know, and demand is the poem itself. If the poem is coming to you, um, you know, you, you have a responsibility toward that poem. And if it's going to find an audience, it's probably going to find one there. Although I have a very good friend sitting in the back row who doesn't, who writes wonderful poems, who doesn't worry a whole lot about getting them out there in the world. And no matter how many times I browbeat him. But, um, you know, we have that responsibility to our, to our poems, that we've got to get them out there. And then, you know, you just got to, I mean, for me, and for, I mean, this might even be a generational thing, you've got to put yourself in the context of other work. Like, I'm doing this, and what have the people who've come before me done? Or even the people around me, what, you know. So it's, I mean, there's an obligation to be imposed. You've got to know what's come before, and then you've got to know what people are doing now. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's work, and, and you've got to read some poems. Some, sometimes poems are, are not a lot of fun to read, but, or you know are bad, but I'm going to read that bad poem. You know? <laughs> so it's a process. Value the process and value the things you come up with along the way. Don't do a Sylvia Plath thing and go out and burn everything. You, you know, don't do that. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's all. But, if I, you know, you just, you just have to do it. You know, that's, that's, and value doing it. Okay, I am going to sign books. I'm going to walk through and ignore you all and go sign books out there by the literati people. Thanks. <laughs>